Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Study Design, How and When to Use Multiplex Immunofluorescence Imaging in Your Research. I am Antonina Salcido of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Leica Microsystems. To learn more, please visit leica-microsystems.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, you may also submit any technical issues into this Ask a Question box. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credit. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Melinda Angus Hill, lead scientist and application manager for Cell Dive at Leica Microsystems. Melinda, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Melinda Angus Hill and I'm lead scientist for Cell Dive at Leica Microsystems. Today I'll discuss an important topic surrounding how and when to use multiplexed immunofluorescence imaging in your research. Translational research is critical to understanding how scientific observations relate to human health. In translational research, animal models are commonly used following a thorough justification for their use, including replacement, refinement, and reduction of animal experimentation. Animal models are often required when considering a more systems-based approach to translational research. Recently, however, the availability of high-quality, clinically relevant human tissue has increased. These biobanked samples are linked to de-identified clinical information, as clinical trial participants often consent to research or access to their tissue samples outside of the clinical trial. While access to high-quality, clinically relevant human tissue has improved, Dividing the tissue among multiple researchers often limits the scope of the research that can be conducted, but still this means that more researchers can gain access to these rich tissue samples for translational research. But new technologies including RNA-seq, mass spec, or multiplexed immunofluorescence imaging can enable multiplexed quantification of biomolecules even with minimal amounts of tissue. Since high quality samples are precious, Implementing a robust study design is essential to improve the value of the biomedical information that's derived from the tissue, whether mouse or human. This webinar will focus on study design and considerations for planning a study, including experimentation and when and how to use multiplexed immunofluorescence in your research. I'll introduce aspects from my translational research in my lab using mouse models of colon cancer to understand human disease. The purpose of this is to demonstrate where the availability of multiplexed immunofluorescence would have improved the use of resources and shortened the time from research question to results. Commercially available multiplexed imaging and analysis systems are only recently becoming robust and accessible. Therefore, consideration of study design and research questions is essential before investing in these technologies. My lab was interested in the early stages of tumor initiation and cancer prevention, which led us to the field of mind-body medicine or stress reduction in cancer prevention. In this field, researchers use prospective studies to survey participants on behaviors and compare survey results to outcomes. These studies are becoming more prevalent over the last 20 years. And research in mind-body medicine with cancer patients and survivors and cancer prevention is still increasing. Embarking on prospective cohort study for mind-body intervention is very expensive and can take years to complete. Here, the application of a mind-body intervention in a subset cohort of individuals is followed by years of analysis into whether the intervention affected the outcome, in this case, cancer prevention. As daunting as these prospective studies seem, using mouse models as an alternative for mind-body medicine studies can be an effective way to study cancer prevention. Mice have very similar biological aspects to humans, but mice are inbred and so are genetically similar, which reduces many inherent variables within the study. 
Mice can also be genetically manipulated. We developed a mouse model of colon cancer that combined genetic mutations that are commonly found in human colon cancer. Over 85% of human sporadic colorectal tumors arbor mutations in the APC gene, and a subset of those also have mutations in the TCF4 gene, which is called TCF7L2 in humans. And TCF7L2 is also strongly associated with type 2 diabetes. While mouse models can be effective for mind-body intervention, conducting the study can still take years to complete, from breeding a study population to running the study, defining outcomes and molecular mechanisms that underlie the results. While reducing variables is essential for this type of research, unforeseen issues that can affect the stress levels in the animals can destroy the experiments, so including construction or changes in diet that can affect the research outcomes. My point here is that with the goal of replacement, refinement, and reduction in animal research, the biological materials are precious. So technologies aimed at understanding biomolecules in the tumor microenvironment must not be sample intensive. Therefore, good study design is essential to prevent the loss of months or even years on research with limited biomedical value. Robust study design is critical to any study with tissues that are derived from a population with specific treatments and associated outcomes. In an, in an environmental rich enrichment study, we applied stress reduction techniques to mouse models of human cancer. Here, mice had access to toys and exercise and other animals in an enriched environment. You can see many of the animals taking full advantage of this enriched environment. Non-treatment control animals were housed in an environment with few animals and limited enrichment opportunity. A colleague biostatistician stated that many researchers only consider the sample size required for significance after a study is complete and are often disappointed to find that their study was underpowered. While these underpowered studies can still be helpful to provide sample size information for future studies, you should consider sample size in the study design phase. For example, we competed, uh, completed a smaller proof of concept study to inform sample numbers necessary for a more significant environmental enrichment study. It's also essential to have a well-formulated hypothesis so you can acquire the appropriate samples. For example, since mutant TCF7L2 is associated with human colorectal cancer and type 2 diabetes, we collected samples to explore the role of environmental enrichment on TCF-dependent phenotypes. Beyond hypothesis-driven science, we also collected stool and tissue for omics-type experiments using RNA-seq and microbiome sequencing. An essential part of sample collection is to ensure that enough sample is available to address the research question. Also, what controls are crucial, including technical and biological rel uh, replicates. The amount of tissue required to explore biomarkers must define, be defined early on for multiplex imaging experiments, especially if the method is tissue destructive. And then finally, considering how you'll analyze the data is essential during the study design phase for multiplexed imaging studies. If using AI-based methods, model training requires a subset of samples for annotation and training. And here, those samples must be similar to those used in the study, including representatives from a cohort of treated and non-treated individuals that won't be part of the study. In the case of a retrospective cohort study, a researcher is limited to samples collected at the time of the study and of the associated clinical data. Even in the absence of physical samples, clinical information is a component of a robust study design. Often tissue is available without associated clinical data. This material can still be valuable as technical controls within a study, as I described in the example of AI model training for analysis. Conventional therapies and the emerging field of immunotherapy have expanded the immediate need to understand immune tumor cells within the tumor microenvironment. In preclinical or retrospective studies, characterizing existing biomarkers or identifying new biomarkers with potential predictive value may improve patient stratification and therefore affect future patient therapies. I'd like to take a few minutes to consider study design in these biomarker studies. With biomarker studies, considering sample numbers before the study begins is the most critical part of study design. With low patient numbers, you may compromise the predictive value of the model. Again, consulting with a biostatistician before the study begins 
will help to calculate the sample size needed to obtain significant results. For example, suppose the study is to define the predictive value of a biomarker. In that case, considerations for sample size calculations will require an understanding of the prevalence of the biomarker in the positive and the control populations. A smaller exploratory study to understand biomarker prevalence can guide sample calculations for a more extensive study. Beyond sample calculations, it's also important to consider sample format and tumor heterogeneity. For sample format, will the entire tissue section or tumor cores be used in a study? Comparing heterogeneous and non-heterogeneous tumors with tumor cores will require an estimation of how many cores are needed to sample the heterogeneity accurately. In addition, how will the data be handled to reflect that heterogeneity? You must consider these issues before the study begins to prevent drawing incorrect conclusions from the data. Finally, to improve the quality of biomarker studies, there are guidelines called the Reporting Recommendations for Tumor Marker Prognostic Studies, or REMARC guidelines. The links to these guidelines and publications are here. Once the study design is complete and you've conducted a well-powered study and samples are collected, you can explore research questions considered during the study design process. Back to the preclinical mind-body enrichment studies. We set out to define whether exposure to a stimulating environment extended the lifespan of tumor-bearing animals. And we found significant improvement in lifespan in both male and female enriched animals, an extension of 55 and 82 days. That's an impressive increase of one quarter to one third of their lifespan. The mechanism behind this increased lifespan was unclear, but still in male mice, environmental enrichment reduced systemic levels of two inflammatory biomarkers, suggesting that the mechanism may involve reduced inflammation. While I'm not showing the data here, the reduced inflammation was not due to reduced tumor genesis. There were no significant differences in the tumor size or tumor load of enriched compared to non-enriched animals. Moving to the next chapter of the study, we work to define the underlying mechanism behind the effects of environmental enrichment on improving the lifespan of tumor-bearing animals. Anyone that's done research knows that often results are negative. This study is no exception. I've intentionally left this slide blank to represent these negative findings. We had a well-formed hypothesis that the improvement in lifespan was related to the role of TCF in type 2 diabetes and metabolism, but this line of experiments resulted in negative results. Still, publication of these negative results was essential for demonstrating the mechanism for lifespan extension following stress reduction is not related to the role of TCF in di diabetes and metabolism. The most investigation up to this point on the mechanism that underlies improvement in lifespan was negative. The crucial preliminary data that I discussed earlier pointed to the role of reduced systemic inflammation as part of the underlying mechanism. A reduction in inflammation is a key step in the wound repair process. The wound repair process is an orchestrated program involving multiple cell types required to heal the wound, including normalized blood vessels, re-epithelialization, tissue remodeling, reduced inflammation, and scar formation. Tumors resemble wounds that do not heal due to the inability to resolve the wound repair process. Therefore, we formulated a new hypothesis that colon tumor-bearing animals housed in a stimulating environment have improved lifespan due to the resolution of the wound repair process and reduced systemic inflammation. To begin to explore this hypothesis, we turned to RNA-seq. Embarking on an RNA-seq experiment is expensive, especially with dozens or hundreds of samples. It's essential to approach these experiments in a hypothesis-driven way to ensure that you consider the appropriate controls and possible outcomes. Our RNA-seq experiment compared normal and tumor tissue isolated from the colons of tumor-bearing animals in enriched or standard housing environments. Perhaps most important for RNA-seq experiments is to consider how you will analyze the data. For example, to help understand the complex disease-related data that we collected from this study and apply statistical methods to the analysis, we use Kyogen's Ingenuity Pathway Analysis, or IPA. IPA enables researchers to move beyond expression changes in single transcripts towards expression changes in pathways, disease state, or function, among others. 
This type of analysis is essential given the systems-based research question. In the end, a well-formulated experiment can help to reveal the mechanism and new biology that you can further test to move beyond the descriptive cataloging of expression changes. Once you've collected your RNA-seq data, you can begin the analysis. I once heard a statement from an individual in a biotech company that they don't have time to spend months analyzing RNA-seq data. Still, moving beyond simple cataloging of expression change is essential. And while data analysis is labor intensive, many tools exist to speed the process without compromising the experiment. For example, by using IPA to define disease and pathway-centric RNA expression changes, it was apparent that while environmental enrichment did not statistically alter tumor size, we observed reduced expression of genes that are commonly expressed in colon cancer. And TCF4 and APC are negative regulators of this pathway. These results suggested that at the cellular level, the tumors were moving towards a more benign state. Taken together with the systemic reduction in inflammation I showed earlier, this epithelialization within the tumor pointed to an activated wound repair process. In colon tumors, angiogenesis results in tortuous leaky vessels, whereas enrichment results in tumors with expression patterns consistent with normalized vasculature. Finally, enrichment increases the expression of markers of the parasite lineage, a multipotent cell type that surrounds and stabilizes vessels and is important in tissue remodeling and scar formation. Again, these transcriptional changes are consistent with activation of the wound repair process. The RNA-seq data helped refine the hypothesis, and we set out to directly test the hypothesis using biomarker imaging studies. To verify and expand our research beyond the descriptive cataloging of RNA-seq changes, we utilized a traditional tissue imaging approach for biomarkers with altered expression in enriched tumor-bearing animals compared to non-enriched animals. We used serial sections from each sample to explore biomarkers involved in vessel normalization, re-epithelialization, and tissue repair. These experiments were a systems-based approach to test various aspects of the hypothesis that environmental enrichment initiates a tumor wound repair response. For today's webinar, I won't go into the details as this data is published, and if you're interested in the findings, I'd encourage you to visit the Bice et al. paper. I'm showing these figures to highlight the work required to explore a handful of biomarkers across tissue samples. At the end of the work, the tissue is exhausted, the results are published, and you move on to setting up subsequent studies to address further research questions. Fast forward to today. Now powerful new methods allow researchers to ask more questions using a single tissue section for biomarker imaging studies. Recently, there's been a rise in the technologies that enable multiplexed imaging, replacing the traditional and sample intensive approach. What is multiplexed tissue imaging? With multiplexed tissue imaging, we begin with the same tissue block sectioned out onto a microscope slide. But instead of staining adjacent tissue sections, an iterative workflow uses staining on the same slide. Shown here in this video is a staining of 15 biomarkers using the cell dive multiplexed imaging solution. Let's put this into perspective by returning to research in my lab. At the end of the study I described, we had a nice story with new insights into the mechanism that underlies lifespan extension in enriched colon tumor animals. Perhaps most surprising was the positive role of B cells and parasites in antitumor activity through activation of the wound repair process. But this was the end of the study, since conventional immunofluorescence methods results in depletion of the tissue with new multiplexing technology, researchers require only a single slide per sample, the tissues preserved, and the research can continue, along with the generation of new insights. For example, here's a list of additional questions we'd like to answer but can't without investing in another environmental enrichment study. Given what I've presented up to this point, there are several aspects of a multiplexed imaging solution that in my mind are essential to get the most out of the precious tissue samples. First, the multiplexed imaging solution must be adaptable. My research questions required the use of antibodies to a unique set of biomarkers that are likely not available in kit form. 
This solution must allow me to use the antibodies I validated on FFPE sections and will enable me to validate new antibodies and also round out my study with additional pre-validated antibodies. It must be reliable. I want data from every biomarker on every slide to be reliable to enable me to answer my research questions. It must be easy to use. There are many multiplexing workflows where components require hands-on data manipulation, but I want all aspects of the image processing to be automatic, including imaging corrections, alignment and registration and stitching. The tissue region that I can image must be flexible. We often image smaller mouse tumors, but also image large biopsies or multiple samples on a single slide. So the solution must enable imaging of most of the slide area. It must be scalable. I want a solution that can be used for small studies or with automation for large studies to optimize the use of the imager 24 hours a day. And finally, the process must be tissue preserving. What do I mean by tissue preserving? I mean that the multiplexed imaging process must be gentle, so the fluorescent antibodies that are imaged in earlier rounds have access to the same tissue as antibodies imaged in later rounds. Beyond that, I want the ability to return to the same slide weeks or months later to continue to layer new biomarkers on top of the existing data for the slide. I'd like to discuss the Leica Cell Dive multiplexed imaging solution coupled with the needs I described on the previous slide. Each of the five columns shown here is a single component of the overall Cell Dive solution. I described the need to be adaptable. This adaptability would enable you to characterize antibodies currently used in the lab for use in cell dive. It's important to stress that the cell dive process uses conventional immunofluorescence techniques on FFPE sections. So it's likely that the antibodies used in the lab on FFPE sections will be compatible with the cell dive process. But new antibodies can be validated. So as part of the cell dive solution, a detailed protocol enables the validation of new antibodies for your study. To round out a study, part of the cell dive solution provides access to a validated antibody list of over 350 rigorously validated antibodies that are proven to work with the cell dive process. Next, along with validated antibodies, a proven process results from years of research with many patents covering the bench work portion, including the slide preparation process with a patented antigen retrieval protocol. This process ensures that as many antigen sites as possible, are available for antibody binding, increasing signal intensity versus samples prepared by more traditional means. Additionally, the process includes the method that enables iterative staining, which is gentle and tissue preserving. I describe the need to be reliable, flexible in imaging, and easy to use. First, the cell dive acquisition software uses instrument calibrations to implement image corrections to ensure that small or large regions of interest are seamlessly stitched and precisely aligned to enable downstream single cell analysis. Additionally, the software was purpose-built for multiplexing. With many samples and many imaging rounds, you can imagine it's challenging to track slides through a study. The cell dive acquisition software makes it easy to manage many slides and many studies at a time. The cell dive imager contributes to reliability, flexibility in imaging, and ease of use with the software. It is a robust automated microscope with customizations to make it a dedicated tissue imager, including an onboard barcode reader and five channel capability. Finally, as you can imagine, collecting all these beautiful images is just the beginning. We've partnered with Intica Labs for analysis and insight generation from imaging data. Packed with powerful analysis modules, including an AI module, the HALO software is powerful and easy to use. While discussing multiplexed imaging, I'd like to go into a little more detail here about slide holders, because a slide holder is essential for any multiplexed imaging solution. While slide holders must hold slides, a well-designed slide holder can improve a multiplexed imaging workflow. In the next few minutes, I'll explain why. Since a slide is removed from and replaced in a slide holder, the holder must be designed with specifications to allow precise alignment and registration between rounds. It must be flexible to enable imaging of the entire tissue. Finally, I described the need for scalability. While the cell dive imager is compatible with automated plate loader, a slide holder must also be compatible with automated plate handling. The dual slide cassette allows imaging of cover slip samples with consistent slide placement within the holder, ensuring precise alignment and registration every time. 
To improve focus and tissue flatness, instead of imaging through the cover slip with variable amounts of media and tissue thickness, tissue is imaged through the slide using a long working distance objective. The dual slide cassette requires that slides are cover slipped, which can be time consuming, requires skill, and applies mechanical forces on the tissue during cover slip removal, which, which increases the likelihood of tissue loss or damage with each decover slipping step. The optimal solution for a slide holder will overcome the need for cover slipping and decover slipping, but retain the ability to section the tissue onto a slide for processing and imaging, since sectioning tissue onto cover slips for multiplex imaging is cumbersome and often ineffective. Further, the solution must allow the same slide to be stained repeatedly to enable the layering of biomarkers over many weeks or months. To overcome the need to cover slip and decover slip, we developed the Cell Dive ClickWell. ClickWell is a unique slide holder that enables an entirely cover slip free multiplexed imaging workflow, preserving tissue integrity and streamlining the staining process. For scalability, the precise engineering of the ClickWell allows the removal of the slide for manual or automated benchwork steps, then placement of the slide in the ClickWell for imaging steps. Or slides can be stained inside the ClickWell manually or using a liquid handler and then imaged in the ClickWell. Finally, the ClickWell conforms to multi-well plate standards and is compatible with any plate handling robotic arm, enabling optimal in imager use throughout 24 hours. The video on this slide shows how easy it is to use the ClickWell. Next, I'll focus on a study comparing staining and imaging workflows with these two slide holders. Here, the study compares the tissue preserving qualities of the ClickWell to conventional iterative cover slipping and decover slipping. There are three different workflows illustrated here. The first workflow, number one on top, is a conventional cover slipping and decover slipping method. The slide has the cover slip removed and is stained using an auto stainer. Following staining, the slide is cover slipped and loaded into the dual slide cassette for imaging. For the click well workflow, in number three on the bottom, the slide remained in the click well for the entirety of the study, or for number two in the middle, the slide is removed and stained in an auto stainer and then returned to the click well for imaging. All slides in this study were manually loaded into the imager and imaged serially. For this study, we stained 28 biomarkers in 12 imaging rounds. Next, we wanted to define tissue loss associated with these different workflows. To do this, we compared the final DAPI round for slides stained and imaged with these three different workflows to DAPI in the baseline round. Probability masks in yellow, which are visible in the zoomed image on the top right, annotate areas where DAPI is present in the baseline round and absent in the final imaging round. Here in panel one, where samples were cover slipped and decover slipped 24 times during the process, 1.65% of the tissue area is absent in the final round. Whereas staining using an auto stainer and imaging in the click well, number two here, had a five-fold reduction in tissue loss compared to cover slipping and decover slipping. And then finally, the most tissue preserving workflow is workflow number three, where a slide is stained and imaged inside the click well, with a 28-fold reduction in lost tissue area compared to the cover slipped sample. A further examination of tissue loss in the cover slip sample shows that cover slipping and decover slipping results in a steady increase in tissue loss from round to round. However, with the red circle following round five, something happened in the process that resulted in a significant increase in tissue loss. This was possibly caused by mechanical damage from the cover slip as it was falling off. But tissue loss is only part of the issue with cover slipping. The second issue is dust and debris from the cover slipping process. Here, the first circle in the graph and the image on the left is round 12, while the second circle on the graph and the image on the right is round 15. The yellow arrows mark additional tissue loss in rounds 13 to 15 compared to round 12 of cover slipping and decover slipping, and the red arrows mark debris that appears in round 13 and then disappears by round 15. These results demonstrate that tissue loss and debris are a moving target throughout imaging. The presence or absence of signal in each round, either through tissue loss or debris blockage of signal, should be carefully examined when you're using a cover slip in multiplexed imaging. For example, following probability mapping in each round compared to the baseline round, those cells that fall into regions with tissue loss or debris should be removed from all analysis when defining cell phenotypes. 
The use of ClickWell in the workflow drastically reduces these issues. I'd like to take a second to discuss why this matters. With cover slipping and decover slipping, at any moment, a catastrophic issue can result in tissue loss. The colon tissue shown in this study is robust and adheres well to the slide, and the researchers that conducted this study are multiplexed imaging experts. If tissue adherence or researcher skill level is suboptimal, cover slipping and decover slipping will exacerbate them. For statistical purposes, the bottom line is that you cannot afford to lose tissue regions or worse, whole tissues on slides. ClickWell enables experts and non-experts alike to perform multiplexed imaging. I've also spoken a lot about tissue preservation. Tissue must be pristine for more rounds of imaging and the continued layering of the next set of biomarkers as your hypothesis evolves. For example, in study design, a colon cancer study where a cohort of patients exhibits a therapeutic response, your hypothesis points to differences in the immune microenvironment compared to non-responders. Here, cell dive multiplex imaging of slides stained and imaged in the click well with 11 biomarkers will address the cancer immunity and progression hypothesis. If your research hypothesis next points to the role of aerobic glycolysis in therapeutic response, you can layer additional markers to test that hypothesis. Here, another seven biomarkers are layered onto the same slide to address the new hypothesis. The layering of biomarkers can continue. For example, if your hypothesis now implicates programmed cell death in therapeutic response, you can layer these eight biomarkers onto the previous 18 biomarkers. This flexibility is critical to get the most out of your precious tissue and enable your research questions to evolve over time. Finally, I'd like to wrap up today's webinar by taking a step back to consider the trajectory of biomarker discovery research. Biomarker discovery research has traditionally focused on the next single biomarker as a molecular indicator of a clinical condition. However, this approach has limitations as researchers realize that single biomarker discovery studies may not accurately reflect the complexity of different clinical states and may limit the translation of the research into the clinic. The true power of multiplex imaging is to enable a systems-based approach with the discovery and identification of a single biomarker in the biological context of multiple biomarkers all assayed together as a system with spatial context. With proper study design, the spatial combinations of biomarkers become indicators of a clinical state and can illuminate clinically meaningful biological interactions. Thank you for your time. Now I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Melinda, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. We also have Dr. Rick Heil Chapdelaine, Cell Dive Sales Specialist, who will be joining Melinda and answering questions today. As a reminder, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Now let's get started. Our first question is for Melinda. Do you have antibodies for mouth tissue on your list? Uh, yes, we have a list of about 30 antibodies where species reactivity includes mouse, and these have actually been validated on mouse tissue. Um, however, from our list of 350 validated human antibodies, the species, act, uh, species reactivity can also include mouse. So I'd say that that's, I don't have the exact number, but I'd say that's about one third of the list. Perfect. Um, and the next question we have, um, what are the struggles you have dealt with using biomarkers? That's a great question. Uh, probably the biggest issue with low-expressing biomarkers um, is one of the big issues. And then how do you detect them while retaining linearity? And kind of the key points of cell dive is that we've developed methods to remove the autofluorescence so that the signal is well above that background. And so that makes the biomarker very easy to detect. Um, also, when you're thinking about study design, we have a lot of recommendations that allow you to um, choose the correct fluorophores with the correct markers to optimize how to deal with uh, this issue of 
low express biomarkers and um, getting great signal to noise while maintaining the linearity. Great, thank you. We have some great questions coming in. Um, next question is, my understanding is that you deactivate the 404 in between rounds, but the antibodies would remain. Can you comment around cross-reactivity? Uh, yeah, so most of the antibodies that are used in a cell dye study, they're direct conjugates, meaning that the dye is conjugated directly to the primary antibody. And this mitigates any issues that might occur uh, or that do occur due to species cross-reactivity. Perfect. Um, another question we have, for the multiplex imaging, how many colors can you use? What is the limitation? Um, laser, filter? I'll take that. Um, th so we have four different channels mm -hmm. that we use along with DAPI for registration. So really, you can do um, four, four biomarkers per round. Thank you, Melinda. And the next question is, the cell dive imager compatible with multi view? I think that's a great question. Um, so the cell dive platform is, we're sort of, you know, while we recommend a lot of antibodies, we're, we can be open to the use of um, different um, antibody resources. However, we have not validated Ultiview on our system. And um, another question we have, is there an upper limit on size of sample with ClickWell slides? The, the ClickWell the slides, um, you, can, you can almost, you can fill a slide almost completely with tissue um, and still use the click well. Um, the, I think the only limitation is that there is a gasket that, that forms the well. And so you have to leave a little bit of room around the edges for that gasket. Thank you. We have another follow-up. Um, is click well compatible with older instrument models? No. So click well is only compatible with the new model the commercial version of cell dive. Well, we have time for um, one last question. Uh, the question is, what kind of stainer do you use? Um, is manual stain okay? This is a good question. Um, cell dive is a flexible solution, so you can stain slides however you want to. Whether you do it on the bench or you can use a liquid handler, you can use a, sides, a slide stainer, whatever solution suits your study. For example, I have a, a preferred sort of um, hybrid of all of these. I prefer to keep um, the slides within the click well for everything but the staining step. And during the staining step, I take the slides out and stain them in a humidity chamber and then return them back to the click well. So, you know, whatever works, what, whatever um, method you prefer in your lab, you can use um, with a click well. Thank you. And we're actually going to wrap up with one more um, that came up. How is fluorescence quenched between rounds? And Rick, if you're able to answer that question. Okay, yeah. So there's a, um, there's a gentle dye inactivation solution that's used to um, chemically inactivate the fluorophore. It's validated against cyanine-based dyes and um, is very tissue preserving. Okay, thank you so much again, um, both Melinda and Rick, for your guys' time today and your important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Leica Microsystems, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for all their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you have provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed now on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with any colleagues or anybody who have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.